Thank you, Dave. How are you? Thank you. Uh, welcome. Look, I've got to say a few welcomes. Can I welcome uh, all the students from Trinity St. David? <laughs> Every time you say Trinity St. David, they make that noise. So I'll try not to say it again. Uh, also, uh, the group from Israel. Where are you? And Spain. It's like the Eurovision Song Contest, isn't it? Uh, welcome. It's fantastic to be here. Um, and it, rather humbling. Because, by the way, can you hear me okay at the back? Can you? No. Do you have any idea what I'm saying? No, it's rather humbling because, as Dave said, I uh, gave a talk at TED about uh, 10 years ago now, and it seems to have been seen pretty much everywhere. And I feel a bit fraudulent. I mean, obviously, it's very good, isn't it? <laughs> Let's not be confused about why it's so successful. I mean, look at me. It wouldn't matter if I didn't say anything. It would go viral. But all I was really arguing is this, and it's all I've ever argued really, is that children, all of us, have really deep powers of innovation, not just creativity, but sensibility of judgment. We're born with them, but it doesn't follow that we will develop them. That's a question of opportunity and education. And I have long believed that our dominant systems of education are not suited to the development of the talents that we now urgently need in our lives. You see, kids love to learn, don't they? How many of you have got children? All right, how about two children? or more, all right. And the rest of you have seen such children. <laughs> Small people wandering about. Well, you know, kids are born as a thriving bundle of possibilities. And they love to learn. And they learn without you teaching them anything. I mean, think, for example, about what kids learn in the first 18 months of their lives. I mean, for example, they learn to speak. That's astonishing when you think how complicated it is to learn to speak. I mean, how many of you have tried to learn a second language? Well, exactly. Maybe you do, I don't know. I, I learned a second language at school. I learned French. Uh, I loved French. Actually, I love the French teacher. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's you. You came back. Thank you. No, this was a man, I have to say. It was <laughs> Mr. Evans. It's a long story, but anyway. Uh, now, Mr. Evans was wonderful. I was very struck by Mr. Evans. This was in Liverpool in the 1960s. Uh, Mr. Evans struck me for several reasons. I didn't, no, he didn't strike me. That was the Latin teacher who struck me. But Mr. Evans was impressive for various reasons. One was, he could speak French, which in Liverpool was not true of all the French teachers, sadly. Um, secondly, uh, he smoked Goulois cigarettes which to me was the height of Exotica. This is Liverpool in the 1960s. Uh, we used to roll our own. And uh, we didn't have what we have now. Uh, oh, yeah, by the way, he'd had garlic. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a drug. I still do think it's a drug. Um, anyway, oh, oh, no, the other thing was he had a French wife. That was really impressive to me. 
and to everyone in our class, he had a French wife. We couldn't imagine it. Actually, we could. <laughs> and we spent the whole sixth form doing exactly that. <laughs> but I loved uh, Miss Evans, but I still didn't get a full grasp of French. But look, kids, when they're little, learn to speak in 18 months. And if they're exposed to several languages, they learn all of them. But the interesting thing about this is, you know, that you don't teach them to speak if you've got children. You don't teach them. And you don't teach them because you couldn't. It's too complicated. They wouldn't have the time and you wouldn't have the patience. You do not reach a point, do you, with your kids where you sit them down at the age of 18 months and say, look, we need to talk. <laughs> or more specifically, you do. <laughs> and, and this is how this is going to work. You've probably noticed your father and I have been making all these noises for the past 18 months. Well, these are not random. Some of these noises are the names of things, and we call them nouns. There'll be 5,000 of them that you'll be learning in the next 12 months. Uh, some of these noises are not the names of things. They're names of things we do with things. We call them verbs. And then, if you modulate your voice a little bit, with these verbs, you can say not just what you are doing, but what you have done and what you will do. And don't worry about the subjunctive. Nobody gets it. <laughs> See, it doesn't happen. Kids just take this stuff in through their skin. So the thing that's always intrigued me, or among the things that have always intrigued me, is that although kids love to learn, although you did, and probably still do, not everybody likes being educated. And the reason I am convinced is that some things happen in the way we've organized our schools which are inimical to the natural rhythms and impulses to learn. And many people consequently go through education feeling they're not very smart or not very good. Not because they're not, but because the system didn't enable them to discover what it was they were good at. And this is my point really, that the system creates the problem. And then we pathologize our children for not doing well in the system. Uh, I'm from Liverpool, as I said, and in my 20s, some time ago, I remember, I went round the local slaughterhouse, the abattoir. I don't know why now. I think I was on a date, you know? I know how to treat a woman. <laughs> Before we go to the restaurant, let's see where it came from. <laughs> so you don't overorder. Anyway, I went round this abattoir, and I mean, an abattoir is a factory that's designed to kill animals. And they do. They're really successful. Very few animals escape. Just I mean, and form survivors' clubs and have annual reunions and say, how close was that? It works. So I went round this thing, and at the end of the facility, it's a bit of a grueling experience to go around an abattoir. I recommend you do it. But at the end of it, there was a door that said, veterinarian. And I thought, well, he must be depressed at the end of an average day. You know, another 2,000 dead cows. Um, so I said, why do you have a veterinarian? And the guy showing me around said, well, he comes in every week or so to conduct random autopsies. And I thought, well, he must have seen a pattern by now. <laughs> so anyway, like another 2,000 cows with holes in their heads there's something happening in here and I'm going to get to the bottom of it. This cannot be a coincidence. My point is, if you design a system to do something specific, don't be surprised if that's what it does. And if you design a school system that's based on conformity and compliance and a linear view of human life, don't be surprised if that's what it promotes. You see, I'm convinced our school systems are rooted in a very narrow conception of ability. 
And the thing is, if you have a narrow conception of ability, you automatically create a very big conception of inability. Or, as we see it, learning difficulties or disabilities. You know, um, I spent the first, this, I, was, I was thinking about this recently, I, I, you never want to draw a straight line between what you do and what you happen to in your early life, but uh, when I was a kid in Liverpool, there was a polio epidemic. I was thinking about this recently, I, I got polio when I was four, until then, my parents were convinced that I was going to play for Everton football team because we lived right next door to the ground. And they thought, he's going to be the soccer player. Anyway, I got polio and you know, I wore two braces at the time. And that pretty much put an end to my aspirations to play for Everton. It wouldn't now. Honestly. I think I'd be in with a chance these days. But <laughs> I'm expecting the phone call any time. But at the time, it did. And the consequence was, I was sent into, when I came out of hospital and did all that stuff, I went to the local uh, special needs school. It wasn't called special needs at the time. We hadn't got the hang of euphemisms in the 1950s. So it was called the Margaret Bevan School for the Physically Handicapped. So they, wanted to say they hadn't really got round to sugaring that particular pill. Anyway, I was at school with kids who had all kinds of you know, physical issues to do with. Lots of kids with polio, there were uh, kids who had cerebral palsy, which is an awful thing to have to deal with. My best friend at school had hydrocephalus, you know, it's water on the brain, he had an enormous um, head as a consequence. There were people with asthma, heart problems, in wheelchairs, on crutches. I was saying recently, my classroom at junior school was like the barroom scene from Star Wars. It was. There were people wandering in, being assembled, so the lesson could start. But the thing was, you see, that nobody really worried about it. Nobody was going around trying to work out what somebody's problem was. And it was only thinking back, I mean, you hung out with people if they were interesting or funny, or they had something worthwhile saying, or you had some empathy with them. But what was interesting to me was, looking back, although the teachers were, you know, very caring, Nobody had any great expectations that anyone there would really amount to much. Because, often, their ability to succeed according to the normal standards of ability was compromised in some way by some difficulty they were dealing with. But what struck me, latterly, is that that's almost true of everybody. I don't know any adult, anybody, I've never met one, never met anybody who hasn't got special needs. Everybody does. Everybody's worried about something. Everybody's dealing with something. It's a psychological thing, or a social thing, or a physical thing. And very often, the thing you think they're worried about is not the thing they're worried about at all. It's something you don't even see and they haven't even talked about yet. It's in the nature of being a human being that we all have some form of special need. And that, to me, is the heart of this. That if we want education, genuinely, to cultivate the talents and abilities of our children, and I'll come on to why in a minute, there is no alternative to having a more nuanced, textured, a more subtle approach to education itself. You see, most our, our impulse to learn is natural, but most of what we learn is cultural. And some of it's explicit in the things we're taught, and some of it is, in, is inherent in the atmosphere of the schools that we bring our kids up in. And the consequence is that many kids, they come through it not feeling very good about it. Now, the thing about this is that over the past 20 years, governments around the world have been trying to improve education. It's not been a great success. And the reason it's not been a great success is because, for the most part, the people who are forming the policy seem to know nothing at all about education. Apart from that, it's been fine. <laughs> for example, the two big strategies to improve education around the world in many countries are firstly standardization. There is a view politicians have that they have to take control and tell you what to do, otherwise your incompetence will let the country down. So we have standardized curricula, standardized testing. You know it if you work in education, it's there for everybody, it, we all suffer from it. And the second is competition. The big strategy is to set teachers against each other 
kids against each other, schools against each other, and you know, the ultimate expression of this is the international league tables that get published every year by, well, every few years by OECD, the PISA league tables, which are not intended to be a problem, and they do actually reveal a lot of interesting information, but they are taken simplistically by politicians. Cassie Salberg, who I'm sure some of you know, is a wonderful man from Finland. Is anybody here from Finland? You're not as proud as they are of coming from St. David's, are you? <laughs> there, see what, see what happens when you mention it. Passy Solberg talks about this as the Global Education Reform Movement, or GERM. And it certainly has proved to be contagious in the way it's operated. But it's, now countries are pitched against each other. And what I want to say to you is that this model is doomed to fail and we owe it to ourselves and to our kids as educators or parents or business leaders to resist it and to do the alternative. The alternative is to humanize education and not to depersonalize it. But in the end, we're dealing with people. And if we lose sight of that, then we lose sight of our entire reason for being in the system. And the second thing is we can change this system. It is possible, and it's not only possible, it's happening. Now, some of you were probably at the 100 presentation the other day, and they're drawing together examples of systems around the world. A lot of the delegations here are doing fantastic work in their own countries, in spite of the dominant culture, not because of it. What certainly shows is that all this innovation is happening in a kind of political headwind. And it's very important that we resist it. That's what I feel strongly. And that, it, and that we can, and the benefits of, of doing that are palpable and, and can be um, spread more widely than they are just now. There's a, there's a potential for a movement, I think, that we're beginning to see. It's one of the reasons I was so thrilled when Dave was telling me before the session that he'd been influenced by that talk I gave that time. But that's now led to thousands of teachers in Australia making big changes, and that can happen. That's how these things do happen. I remember last time I was here, um, I was talking about, in America just now, they're passing, or have been for the past few years, passing legislation to approve same-sex marriage. And quite right. The interesting thing to me is, this did not happen because members of Congress retired to a retreat in Aspen and decided it was about time that they persuaded the country to go down this route. On the contrary, what happened was, people across the country said, can we just do this now? In other words, it came from the ground up. It's not always reliable, by the way as the recent election has shown us, you can't depend upon uh, the wisdom of the people prevailing, but you can cultivate it. So I wanted to show you a couple of things that are related to this. Um, this is where... Has anybody got a third hand? Right. Have you seen this image before? This is uh, a place... Oh, go back. This was a picture taken in eastern India. So I was just speaking into my walking stick. <laughs> How long was I doing that for? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a... Okay, let's start again. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. This picture, that one, was taken in the East Indian state of Bihar. What? What? Can't hear. It's my, it's my daughter over there, by the way. What? No, I use it for walking with. No, no. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Are you still here? I thought you'd gone home. <laughs> I could have done that, Dave, come on. <laughs> Th thanks, Dave. Do you have something to be doing, by the way? Where were we? Oh, that, yeah, yeah, okay. Bihar. This is Eastern Dead of Bear. These parents, these are parents, that's the first thing. In that building are their 10th grade children taking their end of year tests. 
uh, which are essential for them staying in the system and graduating. Those parents are climbing up the wall, handing them cheat sheets so they can complete the test. This picture went viral and many of them got into trouble and some of the kids were expelled as a consequence. But it seems to me a really interesting image of the consequences of intense competition. Now, I'm not judging for a minute the importance of what's happening and the complications of what are happening of the education system in Bihar or in India generally. Now, I'm not making a comment about that. It just seems to be a very powerful metaphor for what parents everywhere are doing, figuratively. They are being driven up the wall and driving their kids to succeed in a system which is inherently inimical to the purposes they wanted to fulfill. This is a good example, I think, of this. For example, one of the reasons that education is configured the way it is, is economic. And if you speak to governments around the world, as I occasionally do, the main reason they have this narrow approach to education is because they believe it's essential to improve economic performance and competition around the world. I've always found this baffling because the result of this pressure for standardization has been to narrow the school curriculum and in very many cases to push out humanities programs, arts programs, physical education to make way for a rather narrow obsession with a particular conception of science and technology, you know, the STEM disciplines, which are tremendously important. Nothing I've ever said is an argument against the importance of the STEM disciplines. I know now people want to get the arts and then they're quite right, so we have STEAM as an acronym. Uh, I was recently at a conference in, in America where they said we need the humanities in there as well, so like STEAM. <laughs> that, where's it end? You know, can we just stop it and have a curriculum that works? But the irony is, when I speak to employers, in fact, if you look at the most recent report from the World Economic Forum in Davos, they are saying we want people who can be creative and innovative, who have interpersonal skills, social sensitivity, all the things that these strategies of competition and standardization are squeezing out of education. And the irony is politicians say they're doing it in the interest of the economy, and I've never yet, never yet really found a business leader who would agree that it's serving that purpose either. But, but this is a good example. Um, despite all these initiatives, which have been going now for about 25 years, youth unemployment around the world continues to grow. These are the figures, I don't know if you can read it all. It, it, basically, these are European countries. But you'll see that unemployment among 15 to 24 year olds remains at historically high levels, and it's been going up. In some of the Mediterranean countries, it's over 40 or 50 percent. These are often kids who've never worked and feel no sense of possibility that they will work. Now, I'm not saying for a minute that this is because of the education system. It's obviously more complicated than that. It's due to the economic dynamics of the planet that we now inhabit. But what it does illustrate is that the education system is not part of the solution. If anything, it's contributing to the problem. Time and again, you'll find economists saying that we have thousands of jobs available often hundreds of thousands of jobs available, but people don't have the skills to fill them. Tony Wagner wrote a very good book about this, about the global skills gap. I say the irony to me is the education system is based on a narrow view of academic ability, when actually more and more what we need are not just people who are acad academically sharp, but people who can put their ideas into practice, because the, the price we've paid is that we've marginalized, for the most part, vocational programs. You know, we still live in a world largely where academic programs are thought to be kind of the premier route to take and vocational programs are somehow second rate. So this is endemic. It's been in the system for a very long time. It has its origins in the system. And that's why I'm saying we don't need to reform this system. We need to transform it into something else. Now the good news is the revolution is actually here. As people have said about the future, you know, the future is already with us. It's just not evenly distributed. And this conference has brought together all kinds of people from around the world who are doing this work already. So I just want to say a few words about that and about what the opportunity is and what it might look like to do things differently. Um, I, I published this book recently. What do you think? It's good, isn't it? Yeah. No, no. The reason for this was, I often, get, I often got people saying to me, uh, 
you know, we saw your TED Talks, and you tell us what the problem is, but you don't tell us what to do. And I have a couple of responses to that. Uh, one of them is, it was 18 minutes. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> and the second is, actually, there's all kinds of innovation out there. Just go and take a look at it. So people say, now, how do we scale the change? Well, it's important to understand how we do that. I'm not arguing for, any more than you should argue for, everyone now adopting the same alternative model in education. It's not about replacing the current system with one that just replicates a new pattern. What's really important is to unleash the innovation and creativity of the teachers and students and the principals in the system, which is what Dave's been doing in Australia, and it's what people in this country are trying to do. People have got ideas, they need permission to develop them and put them into practice. We need to loosen the system up so people can believe that they can do things differently. What we should be doing is cross-pollinating the principles, not replicating a single practice. And as soon as you understand that you can free things up by applying the same principles in a different setting, then you start to liberate how it works. I say a lot of the problems in education are the result of how it's been configured over time. One of them, and I've often talked about it, you know, is how, for example, we educate kids by age group. Why do we do that? I know there's some arguments for it, but really, schools are the only place where we segregate kids by age. When they go out of the school in the evening, they don't all go to separate compounds with their, you know, with their date of birth on them. All the nine-year-olds over this way, please. And don't, don't talk to seven-year-olds, bad things happen. It only happens in schools. And you know it, the system creates the problem. Because some kids are learning faster than each other, and some are not learning as fast. And it's the same in different disciplines. We do the same thing with people at the other ends of their lives. I did a whole project a while ago, well, actually, it went on for about 10 years, in Oklahoma. Is anybody here from Oklahoma? You are from Oklahoma? Good for you. No, listen, I love Oklahoma. I've been going there for 10 years or not. They asked me if I could help to put together an initiative, a statewide initiative, to encourage innovation and creativity across the whole state of Oklahoma. Uh, they said they wanted Oklahoma to become the state of creativity. Now, it's interesting, outside of America, when I say that, people go, really? Inside America, people go, really? <laughs> I say, yes, really. Because there are three and a half million people in Oklahoma and fantastic projects going on. But here's the thing. There's a, I don't know if you know, but in Tulsa, just outside of Tulsa, there's a, a school district called Jinx. It's actually spelled Jenx. But it's, it's pronounced Jinx, just so you know, in case you're ever there. They have a really great early years learning program in the Jinx School District, actually in Oklahoma. And a number of years ago, the, the superintendent of the school district in Jinx had an approach in the district and said, could we help you with your reading program? And the school district superintendent said, yes, that would be great. This was a retirement home. It's called the Grace Living Center. And the person who contacted them was the owner of the, of the Grace Living Center, a retirement home for people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. So they set up a classroom inside the Grace Living Center in the foyer. So these kids didn't go, these young reception kids, they didn't go occasionally once a week. This is where they went to school and still do. It's a permanent ar arrangement they have. So these kids every morning go to school in the retirement home. That's their school. And then they set up something called the Reading Buddies Program, because after a while, the members of the retirement home said, you know, one after another, could we help you? You know, what are you doing? They said, well, we're teaching these children to read. They said, well, could we help? They said, yes, that'd be fantastic. So they set up the Reading Buddies Program. Well, lots of good things have happened. One is, these children are leaving this school reading at grade three level and higher. They're outperforming most other kids in the district. And the reason is, they're sitting with an adult who really cares, helping them and dealing with their questions and challenges at an intimate, personal level. So they're getting personal coaching. The second thing is they're learning much more than how to read, because they're having all sorts of cultural organizations about their lives. 
and the lives of the older people there. You know what it's like when you get very young kids with people at the other end of their lives, like if you see them with you know, uh, grandparents, there's almost a mystical connection between them, isn't it? As people look across the years to each other and see you know, the experience in their face. So you know, these little kids are saying to the, the veterans, so to speak, the people in the retirement home, you know, what was life like when you were my age in Oklahoma? You know, like how big was your iPhone? <laughs> you know, how many gigs did you have? And, and they say, oh, well, we didn't have iPhones, like banjos. Here is mine. So, so they're getting all that as well. The third thing is that the members of the retirement home who are part of the reading program, in every case, have stopped taking many of their medications. You know, their antidepressants and their sleeping tablets and all the things you take when there's nothing in your life to keep you alive. These people are literally coming back to life and living longer as a result of the connection with the children. And the final thing, or the fourth thing at any rate, is that notwithstanding, every now and then, the teachers have to get all the children together to explain that one of the reading buddies won't be coming back again because they're passed. So they have to understand that relationship too, that there's a cycle of life here. Now, most of these are unexpected consequences which simply came about because they changed the model and reconnected the generations. And what we have consistently done in schools is separate the, the generations even in a very fine-grained way, three-year-olds from four-year-olds, five-year-olds from ten-year-olds. But there's no reason for us to do that. There's no law that requires it in most of our countries. It's a convention, it's a habit, rather than natural requirement. So, there is room for manoeuvre. And um, part of it is for us ourselves to become more um, creative in the way we look at the system. I came across this reason, I'd, I'd rather like this. Just take a quick look at this. So some of the things in our way, we can just get rid of them. And I'll tell you why it's important that we should. Without going into stuff we don't need to talk about right now, about the need for the change, I mean some of them, some of the, the some of the urgent pressures for change are to the rampant development of technology, the growth in human populations, the strains on the Earth's natural resources, all of that. I write a bit quite a bit about it in the, in the creative schools. But also, our children are changing. And it's important we understand that, that they are changing in ways that were not true, certainly when I was a kid and when many of you were here. Even people who are quite young now uh, were not exposed to the same pressures they have. I mean, for example, puberty in human populations is occurring at younger and younger ages now. In some populations, kids are going into puberty about the age of eight or nine. Well, 100 years ago, it would have been 14 or 15. So kids are having all these struggles of sexual identity at a much younger age, while they're being exposed to all sorts of demands from the mass media and from social media for them to you know, take care of their own appearance and to make themselves more attractive. They're becoming teenagers, so to speak, at a much younger age. It's interesting to me, for example, my father left school at the age of 14 uh, in 1928. He was born in 1914. He had no idea that he was a teenager. And the reason he didn't is they hadn't been invented at that point. Teenagers weren't really invented until about 1947. And the teenagers largely were stimulated by the extension of compulsory education. People went to work and often started having, well, not at the age of 14 necessarily, but they were having the sorts of lives now which are often delayed for our kids into their 20s. So, uh, the second thing is our children are becoming more and more sedentary and dislocated from their physical 
uh, bodies and needs. I've been working latterly with uh, a, a global campaign that's supported by Unilever uh, called Dirt is Good. It's about the importance of play in children's lives and of physical activity. I think it's really important. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I'm sure it's true of, lot of some of you here, I spent most of the time at the weekends out the house, outdoors, you know, playing in the street. I mean, my parents just shut the door at me in my face and told me not to come back. But we just played in the streets. I'm, I'm not saying that was a romantic thing. It was, there was no reason to be in the house. You know, there's nothing in there. We just played out and made up games. For most of human history, children play, have played outdoors with each other, kind of rough and tumble physical games driven by their own imagination. And now, they don't. In fact, they hardly go out. One of the studies that we did as part of this program was to ask parents how much time their children spend outdoors these days, on their own, unsupervised, you know, with unstructured play. How, many, how much time do they spend? On average, across all these different markets, kids around the world spend less than an hour a day, often much less than an hour a day, outside playing with other kids, just hanging out and making stuff up. Or even being outdoors at all. Incidentally, an hour a day is half the required amount of outdoor activity for high security prisons. We made a little film, you check it on the internet, it's called The Prisoner, where we filmed at Wabash uh, High Security Prison in Northern California, where they get two hours a day outdoors. Our children are incarcerated. And one of the reasons is that parents are so nervous that bad things will happen to them. A second is they're spending a lot of time on, you know, playing video games and with digital culture. And a third is the pressure of schooling is driving them down. The other consequence is our kids are taking more and more antidepressants. They're being medicated more and more often for things which are actually a normal function of childhood. Can I ask you, by the way, how many of you here are over the age of 40? Okay. How many of you, can I ask you, have had your tonsils taken out? All right. How about people under the age of 30? How many of you had your tonsils out? Now, it's interesting. Ask people in my generation if they've had their tonsils out. You've not been asked that for a while, have you? It doesn't come up socially much, does it? You can come to the party, but do you have your tonsils? People of my generation routinely had their tonsils taken out. I mean, they routinely had it taken out once. I don't mean they kept taking your tonsils out. That would be shocking. <laughs> Leave my tonsils alone. The first sign of a sore throat, you would be taken to the doctors and had your tonsils taken out. Um, in fact, sometimes if your sibling had a sore throat, they'd take your tonsils out as well. When I was a kid, you couldn't afford to clear your throat in public. Or somebody would grab you by the throat and take your tonsils out. It was epidemic, and it doesn't happen now, because on the whole, doctors have thought better of it and think, let's just leave them alone, give them antibiotics if necessary, but they'll get over it. But it was a fashion, a medical fashion. Our kids don't have that problem anymore, but they are subject to another fad, which is the fad of over-prescriptions for ADHD. Attention Deficit Disorder. Now, I'm not saying, I've never said there's no such thing, is it? Um, but an epidemic on this scale, and I know for a fact, because I speak to pediatricians about this, kids are being prescribed this stuff simply because they're not able to sit still in school. And, and you think, well, let them get up then. Let them move around. Because this is coinciding with the end of um, uh, physical activities in school outdoor activities, people are kept indoors. It's one of the reasons, by the way, I'm, I'm a great supporter, and I hope you will be too, of a movement now called Outdoor Classroom Day, which is getting kids out you know, into the, the world around, into the natural world, to reconnect them with themselves and the world that they live in. <coughs> so what, what do we do about all this stuff? When I was working on, uh, on creative schools, one of my premises was this, I just want to share it with you because a lot for me flows from it in terms of strategy and practice. My conviction has always been that we're born with immense natural talents, <coughs> but these are like the world's natural resources. They're often buried beneath the surface. They have to be identified, recognized, valued, and cultivated. Let's say all kids learn to speak, 
mostly. But if you're born in a household with four or five languages being spoken, you learn all of them. But kids do. I meet people in European institutions, Americans, who can speak several languages, not because they're linguistically gifted, but they grew up in a multilingual context. Because the fact is, learning is natural, but most of what we learn is actually cultural. So a lot of this is about opportunity, and, and then having the support that's needed. So my base is this, that all of us, you included, do not live in one world. We all live in two worlds. And it's pretty obvious to say it, but it's true. That it's true of you and your children, that we, there is a world that exists only because you exist. And there's a world that exists whether or not you do. You know, the outer world was there before you came into it. It will be there when you've gone. It's the world of other people, of events, of objects, of history, of technology. The world that surrounds your skin. That world was there when you came into it. And hopefully there'll be something of it left when you go. But there's another world that only exists because you exist. It came into being when you did, and it will either end or transmute when you do, according to your own belief system. It's your inner world of feelings, your inner world of perceptions. The only way in which you perceive the outer world is through this inner one. It's the world in which R.D. Lang once said there's only one set of footprints. Our schools are filled with the external world, but they pay far too little attention to the child's inner world, and it's the inner world that determines whether or not they engage with education or they don't, and what they make of themselves or they don't. So this very narrow conception of education, which has got focused on a, a small group of disciplines and standardization, is often directly at the expense of the richness of the child's inner life, which is the only thing, really, that they can depend upon to engage with the world around them. So I wanted to say what I thought the aims of education were. Education is one of those terms that the philosopher Walter Bryce Galley once said is essentially contested. What he meant is, we shouldn't assume we mean the same thing by it when we say it. To listen to politicians talk, they obviously don't mean what I mean by it. But there are other terms like that, like freedom. It's a contested concept. The founding fathers of America took it to be self-evident that all people are born free. But many of them own slaves. So they clearly didn't think that was part of their conception of freedom. America, where I live now, promotes the idea of democracy around the world. And yet, it seems to be incapable of conducting a democratic election. It means different things to different people. So education to me means this at least. I mean, you can disagree. I'm sure you will. But if I had to explain to you, this is what, how I would say, this, this is what my touchstone. This is what I think we're talking about. That our aim of education is to enable students to understand the world around them. And that's why we need sciences. It's why we need the social studies. Uh, it's why we need technology. We're engaged in all of these processes, and the curriculum should be full of those things so we can uh, understand the world that we've come into, how it got to be that way, and how it can shape it. But it should also help them understand the talents within them, as I say, so they can become fulfilled individuals and active and compassionate citizens. I did an event a few years ago in uh, Vancouver. It was a peace summit. It was called the Vancouver Peace Summit. They're very good at titles in, in Canada, that's what I've discovered, a bit literal. But I had to, the opening session was called World Peace Through Personal Peace. And I was moderating the opening panel. There were ten of us on the panel, and the guest of honour was the Dalai Lama. So I had to introduce the Dalai Lama. Now Dave had to introduce me. But I <laughs> had to introduce the Dalai Lama. Well, you know, the Dalai Lama is head of a wisdom tradition that stretches back over 2,000 years. And he is the 16th incarnation of the Lama in a continuous line back for two millennia. So there's a lot to get in to an introduction, you know, if you're aiming to be comprehensive. Anyway, I then realized I didn't have to introduce him. Because I thought, anyone whose name starts with THE... <laughs> you've arrived, haven't you, socially? <laughs> Do you feel? I'm sorry, which Dalai Lama are you? <laughs> that would be THE. <laughs> Can I call you THE, by all means? He said lots of wonderful things. One thing he said was, it's a very simple thing, he said, um, to be born at all 
is a miracle. So what are you going to do with your life? And it's such an important point to make, isn't it? Because the chances of you being here are vanishingly small when you think of it. My brother John has been doing our family tree for the past few years. It's not much of a tree, frankly. It's like a small shrub, really, with a <laughs> curious fungus infection in the roots and what we can make out. But, but John found that all our eight great-grandparents were born in Liverpool in the mid-19th century within two miles of each other. That's how they met. They ran into each other in the street or in the pub. I mean, you might say, no, this is not the situation. There is a larger cosmic force at work here that brought these people together in the same point of the space-time continuum, possibly. I don't think so. Uh, I just think people had lower standards then. In the world, they ran into each other in the street and thought, you will do. You know, honestly, they didn't know that Brad Pitt was out there. It wasn't, wasn't an option. But you know, then they married, and then they had kids, and then those people met, and then, and then eventually my parents were born separately, and then they met, and then there was that night in the pub, and here I am. You know, it's a miracle. But many people spend their lives not sure what their purpose is, not sure what their talents are, and on the contrary, suffering from what now turns out to be the second largest cause of morbidity in human populations around the world, which is depression. Many people spend their lives in states of morbid depression because they haven't found a purpose yet. And that's the Dalai Lama's point, really. You know, what are you to do with your life? So I think education has a deep and fundamental role in that respect, too, of getting people to identify and connect with their true talents. But the system creates the problem, which is why so many people come through it not having discovered what they are. So I'm saying we live in two worlds, and the curriculum has to reflect all of that, and our teaching methods have to reflect that too. I just want to show you this quick video, which I came across recently. That's something I talk about in Creative Schools. It illustrates, I think, many of the points of innovation which are true in the work that I see around the world, and which you will see too. The, one of the big problems in schools, as I see it, is that our kids aren't given access to the full range of their talents, and the, or what they're good at may not be valued. So people who have a, a more engaged and practical cast of mind are often marginalised by the, um, the imperative to theorise and to just purely academic work. This is a project that we came across in Kansas. It's only a couple of minutes long, it'll explain itself, but these are kids who are failing at school, and look at what happens as a, as a result of this particular project. People that I know, they do drugs, they went to juvie, jail. Like, if I would have kept doing what I was doing, I'd probably be sitting in jail, or my mom would have kicked me out by now. We really wanted to form a program for high school kids. People think that at the high school age, it's too late, and we're here to prove that it's not too late. My Drive is an after-school program for kids, and we teach them about math and science, technology, and the environment through hands-on projects. This year, we, we took a carbon gear that was in pretty bad shape. The kids restored it, literally from the bottom up, and then they converted it to be electric. We stripped everything out of it, from the seats to the motor, every part. Kids my age built the car. We're actually powering our car by social media. By having a device that will take your connections to us and turn it into social fuel and literally allow us to power the car between Kansas City and Washington, D.C. We need enough tweets and enough um, Instagram pictures and Facebook posts to get um, this car started so we can tell legislators about MindDrive and what great influences it has on kids. I want to thank everyone for coming today to kick off the MindDrive social tour. It's goal time. these presentations, getting interviewed by the press, and then we start to see this spike in the social fuel. People are tweeting about us, so our car is like, is allowing us to drive in. We find out that Mashables picked it up, and then we find out that Richard Branson wrote a blog about us. 
these students, they're really starting to feel like rock stars. The thing that surprised me the most was how broad the response was internationally. Being able to go to Washington, D.C., you got a voice, spread the word, and not a lot of people get to do that. Learning stuff like this is fantastic. Uh, it's hands-on. You know, that's the thing that makes, you know, innovation, invention, uh, create things, make things better, and it actually makes the world a better place. My draft has told me you could go for it. Well, I plan on uh, graduating high school and going to the University of Kansas. I want to become a district attorney. Believes in you, and I think when we don't believe in ourselves, they do. We're family, basically. When I think of my drive, I feel love. <laughs> the, the system creates the problem. If you change the system, the problem isn't so much solved, it just goes away. I feel that, you know, if, if you're wearing a pair of shoes and they hurt because they're too small, don't polish them, take them off. You know, lift that thing off the gate so you can get through it. So there, there's a lot of room in the system, that's what I'm saying. I know, I know that we all labour under terrible pressures. In this country, for example, head teachers in elementary schools and high schools are facing terrible problems over cuts in public spending. I couldn't minimise that. There's no doubt there's a political headwind that we are still struggling with, which is based on the belief that we have to stop all these programs and focus on a narrow core of academic work and just test kids till they drop. But the system creates the problem. And there is opportunity in the system to change it. People have often said to me, and they did when I was doing the book, how do I change the education system? And part of my answer is, you are the system. You're part of it. If you change what you do, for the children you affect, you have changed the education system. And if enough people do it, we change the whole system. That's how it works. That's why it comes from the ground up, not from the top down. So I just want to make a couple of other quick points before we're done here. One is this, that I think the first step is to be clear what a school is. I, I was asked a while ago if I thought schools were still the answer. I do. But it's important to understand that a school isn't necessarily the way we think of a school. At its heart, a school is a community of learners. That's it. People who come together to learn.